Okay, we'll tell a little bit. I know you probably have lots of things about uh, the, the beginning or the, the family business story is also really interesting. My grandpa started the company in 1917, and he was an Italian immigrant. Uh, he came from a, a small town in northern Italy, and he was from a family of carpenters. So his father and grandfather were carpenters, um, but they were very poor. And so um, my grandpa Antonio learned these carpentry skills uh, from his dad and grandpa. But at the age of 16, um, he decided to come to America in search of a better life. And so he came to Chicago because his cousin was living here. And he did what every immigrant does when they come to this country. He found any work that he could. Um, and eventually he was able to save up enough money to rent a small garage on the west side of Chicago. And that's where he put his carpentry skills to work, making furniture and phonograph cabinets, those old Victrolas that you crank up and play records on. <laughs> and, uh, and then he made a wooden wagon to haul tools around in his workshop. And he called it the Liberty Coaster because the first thing he saw when he came here was the Statue of Liberty. He was always so inspired by the promise of America and um, and he soon he was selling more wagons than anything else. So I think, you know, today we'd call that an entrepreneurial pivot. But, you know, he was just trying to sell stuff that, to build his business. And, whatever and, sold. Yeah, exactly. Whatever sold. So he focused on wagons. And, uh, and then in the late 1920s, he moved to stamping them out of steel in order to mass produce them. And that's really what created this iconic little red steel shiny wagon. Um, and he named it Radio Flyer because radio and airplane were the two highest tech inventions of the time. So they were just uh -huh. two really cool high tech buzzwords. And I think today, if you were naming it, it'd be kind of like the equivalent of calling it something like <clears throat> the quantum AI dronester you know, or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. But um, and so and then and then the business, uh, you know, the business grew from there. Oh, man, that is so amazing. And, and then your dad. Uh, kept uh, came in and, and ran it, and then you came in, and, and then with your you have wonderful brother and wonderful sister members, but you came in and all of you helped and led, and then you s sort of continued on leading, and 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 became the major sort of one that was responsible for leading and and uh, succeed. But how old were you when you really started uh, leadership? Uh, yeah, well, I, I worked here, you know, summers growing up, like uh -huh. a lot of family businesses. But then uh, when I was uh, 23 years old, I joined the company full time. I joined the sales department, which consisted of one person and me in sales. <laughs> and uh, I was a VP of sales who'd been here for a number of years. He was get close to retirement. And so the idea was that I would um, work for him and learn from him and then uh, take over sales was the idea but really soon after i started uh the company kind of was we were we were in complete crisis basically we the sales were declining we weren't uh profitable we weren't we had a lot of debt competitors came out with plastic wagons which was this huge external environment change that um that these plastic wagons allowed uh, uh all kinds of features in them that moms especially really liked at that time and we couldn't do that in our traditional steel and wood wagons so while my job was sales and i was visiting customers and everything because it was our family business because it was so small and because we were in this crisis you know it was this incredible learning opportunity for me because i got thrown into all these situations and decision making meetings that i never would have if it weren't our family business and we weren't in that kind of crisis <laughs> can, can you imagine wouldn't it? Wouldn't it uh, oh, yeah, I remember it. <laughs> yeah, you can't imagine. You don't have to imagine. But wouldn't it amazing to have uh, videos of those meetings? Oh, yeah. And, and, yes. and put yourself in. And at that age, I, what I was while you were talking, I was wondering how were, were you thinking like, oh, my God, how did we get into this? What are we going to do? And it must have been stressful. <laughs> I, I didn't know how bad it was because just of you know, naivete and, and ignorance, um, but it was very stressful. And there were many times where I thought, well, we're gonna go out of business. I, I mean, it was, and I, and I just, that to me was just kind of a very heartbreaking oh, yeah. thought. Like I just, I love the company so much. I love what the brand meant to people. And I had fallen in love with the, everything about it at a really young age. And so, uh, so for me, that's what got me through those dark, times was mm -hmm. the, my love for it and, and my belief in what the potential could be because 
I just felt this incredible sense of gratitude. Like I was lucky enough to be born uh, with the grandpa who started Radio Flyer. How cool is that? I didn't earn that. So, mm-hmm. you know, let's, I wanted to make it something really great. It, out of curiosity, did you feel or worry about that you were going to be one of the leaders that when the company failed and you lost a family? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I've, you know, that old family business curse, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, and she's three generations. You know, that was, <laughs> that was a daily thought, you know, <laughs> like, am I going to, I mean, am I going to be, you know, I wasn't the leader yet, but very soon I did become the leader. And yeah, that was a, that was a key motivation. I didn't want to be that. I tell you, by the way, you fast forward to uh, today and the, the, the third generation has excelled in building the business. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, there's, a, there's a real lesson in that. And one of the main themes of business, family businesses, is that they don't last because of the generations lose the businesses because they don't work hard, don't lead it, et cetera. But uh, that, in a sense, you can say, well, that is not because of it's a family business. It's because the family business members didn't continue to, in a sense, be hungry or learning or excelling, which you have done. And that's certainly a message for all family businesses is, is really the, the main principle that we deal with and you you deal with it. Build your people, build your people so they help build your business and build your family first. So, uh, well, so, uh, Robert, I thought it'd be fun to talk a little bit about what was happening before COVID and then what happened in that first month. And as you say, you were fortunate to be in a business that had a tailwind. So, uh, but what was going on before it happened? And then, and then maybe tell a little bit about your sabbatical you took and how that might have affected if any way sure well i mean the before we had a really great year in in 2019 so it was our our best year ever and so we were going into this year thinking we probably we may not have as big a year as last year because it just it doesn't always (laughs) just go straight straight up but we were looking at having a really solid year this year and um and when it started, when the first beginnings of this happened in China, we have a team in China. So we were watching that really closely. And, and all of our team was locked down in, in their homes during Chinese New Year. And so we didn't know, we were really concerned about production of our products. And we thought that that would be the major challenge we faced this year was not being able to get products. Um, so that was one of the big things we were talking about a lot, like in February, that would probably be the main topic on most of our wow. senior management team meetings. Um, and then in March, when it all shut down here in the US, um, we thought, well, this is gonna be really bad for our sales because usually things like unemployment and, and the economy getting rough do have an impact on us because people have less disposable income and our, our products are not essential products. At least we thought that. Um, and so, um, and so we did a, ran a bunch of scenarios in March, just looking at worst case scenarios of sales being down, you know, 10%, 30%, you know, 40%, what would we have to do? And, and, and what would we have to do things like layoffs and, and things like that? And we determined that even really worst case, we wouldn't have to do layoffs. There would be a lot of other things we could do to maintain the team. And um, so we felt really good about that. Um, and we just battened down the hatches. We looked at cash, like so many other companies, made sure we, we had a healthy cash situation. Uh, we started having daily senior management team meetings in March and April, weekly company meetings, increased the, the uh, team meetings, just really increased the amount of communication, all virtual. Uh, we went from being all in office to all virtual pretty much, which was mm-hmm. a huge change for us. Huh. Um, and um uh, but then uh, in April, we started seeing our retail sales at, at customers like Target, Walmart, and Amazon just go like spike. I mean, really dramatic increases, like holiday type increases. Wow. And, um, and so then we were like, wow, okay, <laughs> what's happening here? And, and you know, we've, we've, as we talked to consumers and we talked to our retail buyers and customers, and they're saying, you know, people can't go to 
on vacation. They can't go to the amusement park. They can't go to the zoo. So they're buying products and we're seeing in everything else we learned about outdoor product sales and mm -hmm. bike sales being mm -hmm. sold out. And, and, uh, and so then we, we shifted from, you know, the, this defensive posture to, we got to ramp up production. We've got to increase our forecasts. Uh, we started doing a daily, you know, we can get all of the sales results from our retail customers every day for every product, but we don't usually track it at that level that frequently. We started doing that to make sure we're really looking at what the changes are so we can react quickly to, to produce more. Um, and so that those are kind of some of the first few months. You know, isn't that funny? What a, what a change from mm -hmm. thinking about laying off people to say, oh, wow, how can we get it all done? And Yes. So you so you had a uh, you had a significant or a meaningful increase in sales and thus production and thus demand and work. Yes. And people are working at home mm -hmm. and virtual. Uh, well, so and that's continuing on now. Is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we've had now like I'm here in my office at work. Um, uh, and we've got maybe, you know, 25% of the team coming in on certain days, like our prototype shop where they have to build actual physical prototypes. Those two proto prototype shop workers are here every day, but the majority of our team is working from home. Yeah. So, hey, well, uh, Robert, and, and well, first of all, congratulations and well done. And what I was wondering about is, can you look back and see things you've been doing and building the culture, such an extraordinary strong culture and people and processes that have helped or if, if you hadn't done those things, it would Yeah, have for sure. I mean, we've, we've talked about that as a leadership team a lot, yeah. that the, all the work we've done on the culture, we're really, really yielding, uh, we're harvesting those benefits now because the level of trust, uh, the level of people just doing the work. Like, uh, you know, we, we, you, you, you taught me all about the external environment and, you know, the, when the ex changing at, at, at least at pace with the external environment, you know, that's all we were talking about is what's happening next in the external environment, everyone in the company um, and everyone, there was never, uh, there weren't people complaining about the hundred problem days. You know, there were people saying, okay, this is a problem. How do we tackle it? Uh -huh. um, so we just really, really benefited from the, just everybody just went into execution mode and, mm -hmm. um, it was, it was really remarkable to see the, uh, you know what I'm thinking, and again, correct me on this, but over the years, uh, you have really, uh, I, I think it's excelled, worked diligently on internalizing the concept that the external environment is is really the, the force that you have to adapt to so the organization has to continuously adapt but then do it and then you mm -hmm. then and not just say that and and preach that but you establish processes so correct me if i'm off here that installing a system where people are really rigorously studying what's changing around me and my job and then building new work and new job designs and new skills is a difficult process and it takes people some years to learn that and then to spread that through the company. But if, if that is correct, then your company is used to that. And so here comes a big, it's an almost a test case, a crisis comes and we're doing this rather than starting from the beginning. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, when we had our when we had our March, we we at the beginning of March before kind of lockdown, we had our big kind of kickoff of the year, and we all share our goals and um, and the the leadership team kind of presents out what you just described that roll up of all the teams talking about changes in the external environment, mm -hmm. and we were talking about COVID, COVID, COVID on China production. You know, <laughs> and that it just shows you like, well, you, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen. So, you know, but then two weeks later, you know, uh, one of our key leaders show, he shows the different domains of the external environment as you, like your process. And, and uh, he basically had, you know, COVID just blocking out every one of the external domains. It's like, this is a really rare occasion where this massive event is just the dominant change in every domain of our external environment. And then 
what does it mean for each one of them? What does it mean for our customers? What does it mean for our competitors? And what do we need to do? And and then that was just a weekly discussion because we had our weekly company meeting and in team meetings. And so, yeah, it was it had a huge being able, being able to frame it that way, having the framework to talk about it um, is just so, I think, powerful because it's this huge, messy, hairy thing. And it seems so overwhelming. But if you start to just drill down, OK, well, then how does that affect us? It, it becomes more manageable, I think, and more actionable. How long were you back into the saddle into Chicago from your sabbatical you took? And then how February 1st. To, it, was it really? February 1st, yeah. <laughs> well, what was that like? And t- tell a little bit about what you did. Yeah, yeah. My family and I, we, we went to Mexico um, and my wife and kids, their plan was to be there for a full year, basically the ac- last academic year. Uh, my plan was six months that I'd be there from August 2019 to February 1st of this year. Um, and during those six months, I completely disconnected from work. I I got a different I got a different iPhone, so I wasn't looking at my email. I got an iPad and put all of my personal stuff on there, so I didn't have my work laptop. So I really I put a lot of things in place to to avoid the temptation or just, you know, looking at, at, at work. And I, I put, uh, put my leadership team in charge and I didn't, I didn't check in for six months and it was wow. first, the first month. And, and that's, I mean, I haven't, I've been doing this job for like 28 years. <laughs> that's the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> so the first month it was like, it was, I was jonesing <laughs> for for my daily sales report and financial report and uh, and just and actually just talking with the team you know i really missed it the first month was was hard for me it was like a it was like withdrawal i would say um um but i i did it i didn't check in and um and then and then i i felt like just kind of things started kind of leaving my brain, like in terms of I wasn't thinking about it every day, like these normal habits of I wake up, the first thing I do is look at a sales report. Um, and and I think I, there was so much from the sabbatical that was great, but I think the main thing for me was that it just, it got me disconnected from the day-to-day uh, tactical work. And so it kind of just freed up my mind. It, one of the things that freed up my mind to do is just wander, just my going on long runs and long walks and hikes, just having my mind wander and not no, thinking, oh, I have to get back for that meeting. Mm-hmm. So, so it just was a huge battery recharge for me. And then February 1st, um, it was like I got shot out of a cannon when I came back to work <laughs> and everyone was like, whoa. <laughs> 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 so, like you've been resting way too much yeah i was like i got all these ideas let's go you know so i tried to rest- restrain myself but my team was like whoa whoa robert what do you, you got some new energy drink or what's going on <laughs> but that helped issue. a lot because then all of a sudden we got hit with this crisis so like i was prime i was prime i was ready what, what a brilliant strategic move. Oh you, my gosh. You sum the up. Timing, you the timing was so lucky. I mean, because if I, we wouldn't have been able to do the sabbatical. Um, oh. And so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. Shot, shot out. You, came, you came from Mexico to shot out of a can. Here right. you are in the middle of February. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really funny. Well, you, you're always high energy and active. Right? You're, you're smart and fast and think fast and, and have great zest for life and humor. And so if you, if you're accelerating. <laughs> yeah, it's, I've gotten a little worn, a little more worn down since those early months. I'm back to my, my normal hyper pace. But. Just out of curiosity, being away and, and having your mind to, to wander and think, did you, did you think about uh, broader perspectives, both on the business and on life or different strategies, or did you have insights that you might not have had? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one of the big ones was that, you know, when I would tell people when I was on sabbatical and, and I was, I did, I tried not to even talk about my job and things. So uh-huh. if I would meet people, um, they would say, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm in commercial real estate. And then they'd ask me no further questions. So 
<laughs> but then if I got, once I got to know people, I said, well, yeah, it's our family business, it's radio flyer. And then, and then I tell them about the sabbatical. I'm like, are you serious? You, 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 come on, you're not checking your email. Like people didn't believe me. And, and I said, no, I'm, I'm not. I have, I have a great team and they're totally handling it. And they would always say the same thing. Wow. You must really trust your team. And, and just hearing that back, I know I trust my team, but hearing that back from people was really powerful because I'm like, you know, I really, I have, I really trust my team and, and they did an amazing job. They delivered our best year ever. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> there's a stay. frightening thought here. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, and I made that joke when I came back, you know, but, um, so for me, I was thinking, how do I shift? How do I continue to shift my job to, to give the maximum impact? And, and I kind of started to coin this this phrase, and that's what I shared with the team when I came back. Was that, you know, the I, my role is really I feel like my primary role is prospector and incubator in chief is how I'm going to frame my position. So in, incubator is this: how do I challenge the team? How do I encourage the team to invent more stuff, come up with more ideas, like really, really ramp up the especially on products, but new business opportunities internally and then the prospector is really being out there more looking for partnerships like the, our tesla partnership and things like that that can really take the business to the next levels so as you guys know we talk a lot and think a lot about the uh, the theme of building the ability to think in order to build the skills to lead so one of the major weaknesses of managers is we get so focused on task and execution and demanding to solve 100 problems a day were inundated from the morning uh, light to the sun darkness with problems and tasks to solve. Critical, important, the problem that drains the time and the energy and the skill to think about your business. So the most important thing for a leader to do, particularly a CEO, and Robert is a specimen of doing that is, and he's always a, such a great thinker, is to spend time thinking about the business as a way to build the business. So I thought it was just fabulous that Robert spent time thinking and then he conceptualized that what he really could do and would love to do and, and excel and not many others can do it, if anyone in the organization, is to really be thinking about ideas for building the business and thinking of new innovations and starting things about incubation of how do I take an idea and then test it and give birth to it. And they do such a good job on product development, for example, and innovations and expansions and growth. And that takes, that takes years of experience and wisdom that you can't study in a class. You can get the foundations, but the experience that he has allows him to look at an opportunity and weigh the pros and cons and ins and outs and the difficulties, as well as possibly getting it done in the marketplace. And that's just a fabulous way to conceptualize the job. And, but, it's, but you look at your job of leading differently, it sounds like. Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I would call it an evolution. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of, I think the next step, it's not that I've completely stopped doing everything else, but I'm doing less of maybe the day to day and more of the incubating and prospecting. Well, that's, I love that. So it's, the law is <clears throat> set your priority to lead first and most and foremost, and then manage second and then do last. You have to do all three and each of those roles is significant, but it takes, <clears throat> there's a, a duty or an opportunity or responsibility to have somebody <laughs> doing the prospecting and to the incubation. And you can't yeah. do that without that, the years of experience. So th does that make sense to you that, that your years of experience lead to that? Yes, for sure. Yeah. So well, well done on that. And then uh, then it's also an interesting question. Would you have come to that if you hadn't gone away to have that time to think about it? I don't think so. I think I, maybe not as clearly as that or, yeah. or at this moment. Um, it just it helped me kind of crystallize it more. Yeah. And um, and part of the prospecting is is just actually putting myself out there more like 
you know, I've started doing more posting on LinkedIn and things like that. And really that's part of that prospecting uh, part of my job is just getting out, putting myself out there more, putting Radio Flyer out there more so that people can see what we're doing and maybe it'll lead to something. Yeah. And Robert, how about uh, looking back, are there any lessons that you've learned over the last year or two that you, you might share or pass on to folks about leading and from your experience? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think one of my big lessons is if I had to do it over again, knowing what I know now, and uh, if I was placed into a situation where I was kind of a turnaround situation, which is what we were, um, you know, 25 years ago, uh, is to really focus on the people first. I didn't know to do that at the time and focus on the people and the team and the culture. Um, you know, it took me a while to figure that out because I was just trying to sell stuff and, you know, fix problems and, um, I think that's the main, main thing, you know, like even, even down to the example of like an internship program, you know, I, I, to, as a talent pipeline, you know, I didn't, we didn't develop an internship program until years into me working here. Now, 25% of our team were interns. And I think about, wow, really? I started that wow. right on day one, you know, how could have that transformed the team faster and, and improved the culture faster? What, what is a current uh, internship program you have or process? Yeah, it's mostly in the summer um, that we have the interns and their college students. The biggest group are, is for the product development team. So they're uh, students who are studying mechanical engineering or industrial design. And uh, it's, it's a phenomenal internship because um, it's real work. They get to come in and work on real products and projects and uh, and we have, we get really high ratings on our internship program. Um, and then we, we always end up hiring, you know, several, a few people from the internship program. And, and it's just a great, you know, as you have, as you've taught me a long time ago, the best way to figure out if there's a match is to try it out. And, mm. um, and an internship is such a great way to try it out because by the end of that internship, you know, we know that person and that person knows us and knows the job and, uh, it just reduces the the risk of making a bad hire so much. Yeah, well, that's just fantastic. And they and then you you design make sure they have work, meaningful work to do for the summer, which is sounds yeah. excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, well done. That well, Robert, I, uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to have you. And I I tell you, it's for me. I have to tell you, it's just I was thinking a lot about this. First, of all, I was so excited to come, and I've uh, uh, just admire you and always enjoy you and you have so fun and bright and smart and, and funny you have got a great sense of humor great wit <laughs> so uh, so and then you bring that spirit to the company and the funness and uh, but uh, folks in terms of of watching this for all of the leaders out there individuals just if you think about Robert and listen to him talk and what he does you know, he's a he's an example. One one of the most important things to become effective and successful and contribute to the world is build your own skills to become effective, personal skills. And so, if you listen to to Robert, he would be a great role model for all of us, and uh, one that you could emulate and think about and uh, study. And so, he had great lessons for all of us to lead and uh, follow and have a good life and uh, enjoy what you do. Life goes by quickly. So, uh, and you can tell from Robert laughing and how much he enjoys what he does and the fun and the challenges. It's not like it's easy, <laughs> but uh, the, the, one of the important goals in the world is to live a good life and uh, make your life meaningful and contributory and successful and to help others in their lives. And uh, so, Leaders lead by becoming the example that they want others to be. Robert would be one that we would all like to be. So can I say one thing? Please, please do. Well, thank you for all those kind words. Um, you know, years ago when I was little, my and my mom still is an amazing cook. And I asked her when I was a kid, I was like, how did you get to be such a great cook? And she said, well, I find really, really great recipes from really great chefs. And then I work on that recipe until I master it. And, um, and I feel like you, that's you, Dr. Bell and Bell Leadership. You've got the recipes for, 
how to be a great leader. And it's a lot of times it's really just following the recipe and then fine tuning it and, you know, achieving, trying to achieve that level of mastery over time yeah. and adapting it to your own culture and your own personality. But, but thank you for your kind words, but yeah. thank you for all the recipes for success. <laughs> I'm very well, that, grateful to you. And, and, and like, likewise to you, but that's a, that's a great story. I, I, uh, I'm not much of a chef, but I, I love building <laughs> recipes, but I love it. Well, eat. you got the leadership recipe. <laughs> <laughs> got something. So we all want to keep leading. The world needs us all and everybody do your best and learn as much as you can. And then we will look forward to, to being with you again and uh, go get them and have fun. Mm -hmm.